Um, but I'm going to introduce now uh, our next speaker, who's my colleague, John Whitaker, uh, who is a consultant cardiologist and electrophysiologist at King's College London and Guy's and St Thomas's Hospital. And he specialises in VT ablation. There's a nice kind of introduction, really, from Chiara about uh, the expanded role of catheter ablation in ICC. So um, it would be great to hear more about that. Welcome, John. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rachel. Um, can everyone see my slides OK? Is that uh, coming through? We can. We can. Brilliant. Yes, thanks. Well, thank you, and um, thank you very much for the invitation um, to talk about the uh, to talk at the ICC conference today um, uh, about um, ablation of arrhythmias in inherited cardiac conditions. So, um, as Rachel said, I'm an electrophysiologist um, working at St Thomas's Hospital and King's College London, um, and I do work closely um, with the ICC team here, um, with whom I'm sometimes um, involved um, with uh, jointly managing the arrhythmias that arise in this in this distinct group of patients. Um, so. Um, as, um, as I'm sure uh, most of us know, catheter ablation is an invasive technique that can be helpful for the management of a whole range of arrhythmias. Um, and the specific indications for consideration of ablation is heavily dependent on the arrhythmia that's being managed, as well as the substrate for, for that arrhythmia. And um, so with that in mind, um, I'd like to talk about separately today about atrial fibrillation um, and ventricular arrhythmias. Um, and in talking about ventricular arrhythmias, um, I'd like to talk about some of the specific considerations that are encountered um, in, in uh, some of the inherited cardiac conditions um, that, that separate it from uh, them from from other uh, other arrhythmias that we that we encounter. So thinking first about atrial fibrillation, um, in the broader PET population, AF is the most common um, arrhythmia that we attempt to treat with catheter ablation. Um, and uh, catheter ablation is an interventional procedure that's designed to promote the maintenance um, of sinus rhythm. Um, and there's a whole um, range of different tools and techniques that are available um, to, to conduct an AF ablation. But the cornerstone of uh, any AF ablation procedure is the electrical isolation of the pulmonary vein. Um, which are recognised as a source of the majority of triggers um, of AF in the majority of patients. And broadly, in both the ICC and the non-ICC population, um, it can be said that treatment earlier in the uh, course of the natural history um, of AF is associated with, uh, with better outcomes. Um, and when patients progress from paroxysmal to persistent AF, um, the outcomes are less positive. Um, and so these considerations really are relevant to um, the group with um, inherited cardiac conditions um, as well as, as those without. And um, it's increasingly recognised that um, in the population of patients who have left ventricular systolic dysfunction and symptomatic heart failure, there's a potential mortality benefit that can be gained from, um, from maintaining sinus rhythm um, through an AF station. Um, and, um, and, and this again is relevant to, um, to, the, uh, to the population in the ICC um, population who, who have impaired um, LV systolic function. Um, so keeping in mind that these um, guidelines um, for management of atrial fibrillation have been um, published with respect to the non-ICC group, um, the principles are generally similar um, and can be applied to those with inherited cardiac conditions as well. In paroxysmal atrial fibrillation, um, there are a broad range of uh, indications for interventional um, for an interventional approach, and this can include um, using an air fibrillation as a first-line therapy. Um, for those with reduced um, left ventricular ejection fraction um, uh, and um, uh, who develop uh, AF, which includes the DCM group, um, there's now a reasonably strong mandate to consider an interventional approach in order to uh, maintain sinus rhythm. For those patients who have a tachycardia induced contribution to their LV systolic dysfunction and over and above the um, AV dyssynchrony that um, uh, atrial fibrillation confers, um, there's the strongest mandate um, for, um, for, for an interventional approach to try to restore and then and then maintain sinus rhythm. And, and I will say that there's um, there are some in the electrophysiology community um, who feel that deteriorating LV systolic function in the context of AF should be considered secondary to the um, AF until proven uh, otherwise. And so then just to um, just to emphasize again that um, in patients with um, inherited conditions as well as uh, other etiologies underlying their AF, um, outcomes are better um, if interventions are performed earlier um, in the process. 
So um, I'd like to briefly mention the issue of catheterablation for AF in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy because this has been a, a controversial topic. Um, uh, in December last year, uh, NHS England made the decision not to commission um, catheterablation for persistent atrial fibrillation um, in HCM patients. Um, and this was based on evidence indicating that outcomes in this group were less positive um, than in patients with persistent AF who didn't have um, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Um, um, and um, indeed, there, there was a higher rate of complications uh, that was seen um, in this group. However, I think it's really important to acknowledge that um, patients with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy often have a great deal to gain from sinus rhythm. Um, with their impaired LV relaxation, they often tolerate the loss of atrial contraction poorly. Um, so despite the fact that there's no doubt the substrate um, is different in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy and that they have thicker tissue and more widespread fibrosis and a, and a higher pre uh, presence of uh, non-pulmonary vein triggers which present technical challenges and um, there is a group of patients uh, with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy whose sinus rhythm can be effectively restored um, and, um, and and they they have a great deal to gain if, if it can be successfully um, achieved and um, so I think this is a, a conversation um, that needs to be uh, needs to be continued um, and again, as with other groups of patients with AF, um, early intervention um, is, is always going to be preferred. And particularly in this group, um, intervening before they progress from paroxysmal to persistent uh, may, be a, may be a particular benefit. And um, so um, what's actually done during an air fibrillation procedure? Well, um, they're usually performed um, as a day case procedure now, um, either under general anesthesia or sedation. Uh, vascular access is um, via the femoral veins, um, and then the left atrium is accessed by a transeptal puncture, and then delivery of energy, uh, which can take the form of radiofrequency or cryoablation, or some of the newer energies such as pulse field ablation, um, are then delivered to create a ring of scar, which is electrically non-conducting around the ostea um, of the pulmonary vein. Veins, um, and in doing so, electrically isolate those pulmonary veins from the rest of the left atrium um, in an attempt to um, prevent those triggers for air actually reaching the um, reaching the body um, of the atrium. We often use 3D um, electroanatomic mapping systems, such as we're seeing in these slightly accelerated videos, uh, which uh, allows us to create a geometry um, of the uh, of the left atrium um, and then deliver that energy um, to specific points in the atrium uh, based on a patient-specific um, anatomy. So um, moving on now to um, ventricular arrhythmias, um, there are a number of situations in which it's going to be reasonable to consider an interventional approach um, and um, happily um, after the excellent summary of the ESC guidelines um, that have updated the um, indications for those, we'll briefly run through these um, as well. But broadly, um, the, uh, the indications for consideration of an interventional approach for ventricular arrhythmias in the ICC population is similar to that um, in the, uh, the non-ICC population. First and foremost, symptomatic ventricular arrhythmias, and this can include, include um, premature ventricular complexes, um, ventricular tachycardia, um, or ventricular uh, fibrillation. Um, in addition to symptomatic um, ventricular arrhythmias, PVC-induced LV systolic dysfunction uh, represents a situation in, in which um, catheter ablation um, of that PVC, if it's successful, can be a significant benefit in actually restoring, um, restoring LV systolic function. As we've heard also, in any patient who's rec um, experiencing recurrent ICD therapies for ventricular arrhythmias, well, an interventional approach should be considered because control of the arrhythmia that's resulting in therapies is sometimes possible and achieved with, um, with, uh, with a catheter ablation procedure. So um, as, as many of you know, the substrate for ventricular arrhythmias is viable myocardium that's usually within and adjacent to regions of fibrosis. Um, and those regions of fibrosis predispose to changes in the myocardial conduction that overcome the heart's intrinsic protection mechanisms uh, that exist to prevent the, um, the onset and maintenance of arrhythmia. And what happens is um, it promotes what's called re-entry um, or endless loop circuits where um, an electrical impulse um, uh, endlessly propagates um, uh, usually, um, uh, usually around an anatomic obstacle. And this is the mechanism um, of the majority of sustained ventricular arrhythmias that, that we encounter. And regardless of the particular cardiomyopathy involved, um, the strategy when we're attempting to ablate these, uh, these arrhythmias is typically to identify the substrate and where possible the specific arrhythmia that's causing problems, and then try to destroy that substrate um, through the application of one of the forms of energy to therefore prevent recurrence of, uh, of the arrhythmia. Um, 
And the specific considerations um, uh, that exist among the different cardiomyopathies really reflect the, the distribution and then extent of the fibrosis um, that informs the technical procedural factors um, and therefore patient selection um, and, and, and allows for an accurate pre-procedural counselling uh, before undertaking um, any, of these, uh, any of these procedures. So considering some of the uh, specific inherited cardiac conditions that we encounter, um, we can identify some uh, specific factors that, um, that are important for decision making within those, within those groups. Um, dilated cardiomyopathy um, is a condition in which the fibrosis that develops is, is very often um, in a subepicardial location. Um, and this means that in order to successfully treat um, the ventricular arrhythmias, um, accessing the epicardial space um, is, is fairly frequently required. And this is important because it confers an additional complexity um, and risk profile uh, with, an, uh, with an interventional approach. Uh, and this is very important for, um, for, for a patient to understand before they, uh, before they sign up for, for such a procedure. Um, the estimate is that epicardial ablation is needed in around a third of procedures for, for VT and DCM, but um, I think there's a sense that in, in, in fact it, it may be that it, it may be higher than that, um, and certainly some electrophysiologists would argue for upfront um, epicardial access um, in all ablations um, in, for patients with delayed cardiomyopathy. Um, my own approach is that the, the judgment can often be informed by high quality MRI imaging, which can actually um, localise the, uh, the, the substrate that you're going to be um, targeting uh, prior Prior to, um, prior to a procedure, and so you can make that decision um, on, a, on an individual patient basis. Unfortunately, outcomes um, following uh, catheter ablation in VT um, uh, uh, for VT and DCM are, are less good than um, for outcomes um, in an equivalent population, for instance, with ischemic cardiomyopathy. Um, and this reflects, I think, the, the complexity of the substrate um, as well as the difficulty accessing it. <coughs> I've, um, I've shared a, a recent example um, of a case of ours that I hope um, demonstrates some of these challenges. And um, this was a patient who had um, extremely extensive reduced voltage, which we see here as the red area area and on this um, on this endocardial um, uh, left ventricular shell <coughs> and they had a similar um, appearance of very extensive reduced voltage so another big red and um, a big red field on the epicardial aspect as well um, and then what we see is each red sphere is then a lesion that's been delivered to try to destroy some of that substrate. Um, and this patient actually ends up having 140 lesions, um, which, uh, which was a total of 66 minutes of, of, of RF energy um, over the course of a seven hour procedure, which I, I think we can appreciate represents a large burden for, um, for a group of patients who often have very severely um, impaired, um, impaired function. Um, and so this is, this is a really important consideration um, that we need to bear in mind when we're, when we're selecting patients for um, for these procedures. Um, but in summary, um, ablation is often the only uh, option we have to try to control refractory ventricular arrhythmias in the, um, the, the DC, DCM population. But it, I think it is important to, to, to understand that these are technically challenging procedures, frequently require epicardial access, which confers an additional risk um, for the patients. Um, and unfortunately, even, um, in, even in the most experienced centres in the world, um, the outcomes in, uh, for ablation of VT and DCM um, are, are, are less good than they are in, in other conditions. So moving on to um, arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathy, well, this is a condition which seems to respond um, in a more positive way um, to, to ablation. And um, it's important to acknowledge that the, the vast majority of the data um, that we have regarding outcomes of catheter ablation in um, arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathy comes from the right ventricular dominant form of the disease. But in this group of patients, and there really are excellent outcomes, and um, up to 75% of patients um, uh, can remain VT-free and out at five years um, from uh, from the procedure. Um, and even those who do have um, do experience a recurrence typically have a, a reduction in their overall VT burden. The VTs that these patients experience are typically monomorphic VT and, and a large majority are sensitive to antitachycardia pacing. So one of the good things is that with a modern device programming, um, the, the number of shocks that um, patients experience can be, can, be, um, can be very low indeed. Um, importantly, this is another disease which preferentially affects the apic epicardial aspect of the uh, of the right ventricle, um, and um, this is shown from uh, or this is seen in rather in, a, in this image from the from the literature that I've shared. And um, on the right hand side um, of the image, you can see the epicardial um, map, which has a very very large um, extent of, of reduced voltage, which represents a substrate for ventricular arrhythmias, all of which has been treated with very very extensive um, radio frequency ablation. And in comparison to the endocardial map, which shows that much smaller and a more limited um, uh, region of reduced voltage um, on, on the left hand side there. Um, uh, and this is important because um, the uh, 
many many electrophysiologists, uh, myself included, would, would advocate for, for an upfront um, routine epicardial access when undertaking an ablation for patients with ARVC. Um, and this again has uh, very important implications for pre-procedural counselling um, in this group of patients. Um, but in that in that group of patients who are experiencing recurrent symptomatic uh, monomorphic VT or ICD shots of VT, um, this uh, catheter ablation um, is is, um, is is recommended as an option. <clears throat> Returning now to hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, um, but this time considering ablation of ventricular uh, arrhythmias, um, ablation of VT and HCM um, is associated with some very specific um, and significant technical challenges, uh, which unfortunately limits the success of this procedure um, in this group. Um, and we can see this from the um, uh, from the outcomes. Um, uh, this is a graph showing VT recurrence um, over a period of um, uh, of 21 months, uh, sub, uh, subdivided by um, uh, by um, by disease process, and this this grey line here is the uh, recurrence rate to, in HCM, and as you can see, it's um, it's, it's above 40% um, at um, at 22 months um, after an ablation. Um, I think um, many of us are. Uh, Familiar with looking at um, MRI imaging um, from uh, from this group of patients, um, and um, and so we're we're used to seeing this this deep um, mid myocardial substrate um, in a in a hypertrophied um, ventricle, and that really represents the, the main issue that we encounter. And um, we know from both. Um, preclinical and clinical um, uh, work that creating deep myocardial lesions that would penetrate a fibrotic area in the middle of a hypertrophied ventricle is extremely difficult. Um, and, um, and this, as well as often the extent of the substrate, um, represents an important reason for, for, the, for the somewhat guarded um, uh, success that we see uh, in, in, this, in this particular condition. But despite that, um, uh, Catheter ablation does often uh, is often required um, in patients who are having recurrent um, ICD shocks or or, or um, uh, sustained VT and and, um, and does need to be undertaken and and all efforts are made to overcome um, those um, those those technical challenges. So moving on to um, Brugada syndrome now. Um, so. As we know, originally this was thought of as primarily or purely rather an electrical disease. Um, it's now well established that there are um, epicardial fibrotic changes that are sometimes seen in the uh, right ventricular outflow tract of, uh, of some patients with the, with the Brugada syndrome. Um, and furthermore, uh, focused ablation targeting this substrate um, can effectively suppress um, ventricular arrhythmias that, that, are, that appear to uh, arise as a result of this substrate, um, as well as result in normalization um, of the uh, of the 12 DCG. Um, and so, and this is reflected um, in the uh, in the ESC guidelines that were recently published, as we've as we've heard, um, in which uh, in which catheter ablation for uh, recurrent ventricular arrhythmias is uh, is is recommended in those patients uh, in whom quinidine is unsuccessful in in um, in, in controlling ventricular arrhythmias. Again, it's a procedure that uh, would require epicardial um, access um, in order to uh, deliver uh, deliver an effective um, uh, ablation. So finally, um, I'll talk about idiopathic ventricular fibrillation. Um, as we know, this is a condition that's diagnosed when specific structural and electrical pathologies, as well as systemic disturbances, have been excluded uh, amongst patients with aborted sudden cardiac death or recurrent episodes of, of ventricular fibrillation. And in this group, there is a reasonably high rate um, of ICD shocks um, for, for recurrent episodes. And, and some of these cases are triggered by a monomorphic PVC. Um, these PVCs characteristically um, arise from the Akinji system, but they can um, arise from other sites as well. Um, and, um, and, and I shared a case here um, of, a, of a patient who was a cardiac arrest survivor um, uh, who, has, um, who had recurrent therapies uh, for a, for a ventricular arrhythmias that were triggered by uh, PVCs arising from the right ventricular outflow tract. Um, and uh, in this group, um, if the PVC that's triggering the episodes of ventricular arrhythmia can be uh, successfully identified and ablated, um, they generally experience uh, very good long-term outcomes. So I'll stop there um, and summarise uh, summarize briefly, if I may. Um, atrial arrhythmias should be treated um, aggressively um, in those with impaired LV systolic function, um, including um, early referral for consideration of catheter ablation. And these considerations um, relate to the ICC population um, as, as well as the, as, as the broader group. The outcomes from catheter ablation in ventricular arrhythmias is heavily dependent on the underlying disease and, and substrate. Um, and therefore the ablation strategy, um, uh, which informs the risks and benefits that may be derived from the procedure, uh, vary very significantly by disease.
the outcomes are generally um, somewhat more encouraging in patients with arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathy, Brugada syndrome, um, and idiopathic ventricular fibrillation. So um, I'll stop there, um, and I think we might be doing questions um, at the end. Um, so I will um, I will hand back to Rachel, and thank you very much for your attention.